joining us for another episode of The Alley. This is actually episode two, um, brought to you by the WP Crowd. Um, I'll be your host, Jordan Quintel. You can find me on Twitter at JordanQ416. Um, today, we're doing things a bit differently. Um, we've got our guest live with us today rather than uh, remotely. Um, so we'll be getting firsthand uh, information. Today's topic is about uh, partial visual accessibility and how it relates to desktop and mobile usability. Um, we're going to look at uh, you know different issues, different resolutions, and uh, hopefully we can pass along some uh, tidbits that will help other people along the way. Um, today we have a special guest. He is my brother Jason, and um, he knows a thing or two about uh, visual accessibility. And uh, I'll let him introduce himself from there. Thanks for being here, Jason. Ah, uh, thanks for having me, man. Um, so my name is Jason. Um, Jordan and I are brothers, as he mentioned. Um, born and raised Toronto native. Uh, went to school here at Ryerson, and then went to University of Ottawa. Just moved back. Uh, I run a small content marketing firm uh, called White Fedora. You can find us at whitefedora.ca or follow me on Twitter at uh, stylish white hat. Um, I'm here to talk about some of the uh, issues I encounter on a day-to-day -day basis when using uh, technology like desktop computers and mobile devices. I think the best place to probably start would be to describe what kind of impairment I have so that I can better describe the sort of issues I encounter and then the solutions. So um, essentially, I suffer from two problems simultaneously. The first is um, kind of a rare form of macular degeneration, which is more commonly found in elderly. Um, essentially what it does is uh, diminishes my visual acuity. So I have a harder time uh, focusing in on objects and uh, seeing them clearly and crisply. Um, I actually have better uh, peripheral vision as opposed to direct vision. So if you can imagine something like like trying to focus on, in on an object or an image and that object gets uh, more clear, the, the less you look at it directly. That's sort of uh, what I'm encountering. Now, um, the, the, the issue that that manifests into is one that has to do with um, zooming in on smaller objects. So small types, small objects, I have difficulty seeing on screens, which means that I need to uh, take advantage of uh, magnifying and zoom features that exist on devices. Uh, the other problem I have has to do with uh, color blindness. So I have um, a condition known as red-green color blindness, which is fairly common among men. Uh, so I had dif a difficulty distinguishing between colors that seem kind of similar. So like dark reds and or light reds and oranges and some greens and or some purples and blues and some greens as well. Um, but really, all this affects is um, so with regards to that, um, I end up having problems having to do uh, with contrast. So I have to make sure that contrast is a very important thing that's on the forefront um, in order for me to be able to have a comfortable reading experience and writing experience and browsing experience on the computer. Um, so that's kind of just a general idea of what's going on with me impairment okay. wise. Um, well, yeah, I mean, that, that definitely puts things into context um, relative to what your difficulties are. Um, so obviously it's, uh, you know, magnification and color contrast are, are the two big accessibility aspects that you utilize, um, you know, on a day to day basis to kind of make sure that you can operate the, the different devices that you use. Mm -hmm. um, so we're going to look at uh, desktop and mobile and we're going to talk about them separately and then probably try and connect them in the end at the end of the day and uh, see, you know, how we can kind of incorporate everything together. And, uh, you know, we'll go into a little bit about, you know, what the specific issues are. We'll go into a little bit about how you combat those. And then, you know, we'll get into some some tools or some tricks that you use to kind of, um, you know, help you get through these kind of things. So right. let's start with desktop. And um, I'm interested to knowing 
Um, you know, what certain things about operating a desktop do you find difficult with your particular partial disability? Okay, so on a, a typical work day, so I do a fair amount of my work on a computer. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm running at home a, a very basic Acer desktop PC running uh, Windows 10 Home. Um, a fair amount of my work involves um, browsing the internet and doing research for uh, topics that later become articles, blog posts, uh, website content, social media content, et cetera. So a big part of my job, um, a big part of my day-to-day -day workflow involves uh, doing a fair amount of research online. This can be difficult because you know, I hate to, to talk in generalities or paint with a broad brush, but as a whole, the internet is not really set up uh, to accommodate people with vision issues. So, um, but like, so I can only, um, for example, like I can only read off of a computer screen for a certain amount of time before my eyes become drowsy and things get blurry. So I have to take uh, frequent breaks for, away from the screen to rest my eyes in order to be able to do a full work day on the on a desktop PC. Now, uh, like I mentioned earlier, reading small type and taking and seeing small things on a computer screen a screen is often an issue for me. So okay. to combat that, uh, I have to take advantage of Windows. One of Windows is big uh, built in accessibility features, okay. which is their magnifier. <laughs> Now the magnifier can be accessed. Well, any built-in Windows accessibility feature can be accessed by going to their settings and clicking on ease of access. Um, from there, you can select um, the magnifier. And for me, for the sake of convenience, <clears throat> I simply pin that uh, program to the bottom of my home right. uh, desktop. Something that you're going to use regularly. So I can just <clears throat> click on it regularly. And the reason for that, it's also handy having it there to so uh, to be able to turn it on and off because. As good as the as the magnifier is, mm -hmm. um, it can sometimes be cumbersome, okay. right? Now, as a whole, I, I'm gonna just a little sidebar for a second. As a whole, when it comes to using any sort of piece of technology, whether it be a desktop computer, smartphone, or tablet, right? Um, I can't speak for everybody with a visual impairment, but what I can tell you from my own personal experience is that I'm a big benefactor of the advent of giant screens. Okay. For, for me, the bigger the screen size, sure. the, better. the better when it yeah. comes to any device, right? <clears throat> so I have to make sure that at home, I have a fairly large um, monitor. monitor, right? Um, an ideal situation actually would be to have multiple monitors set okay. up, right? Um, for a PC, the reason why this is, is because the magnifier itself can end up eating some valuable real, eating up some valuable real estate on your screen. Right? right. So, I mean, depending so, on how you use it. So okay. the, the magnifier itself has uh, different functions or different settings, right? So you can set it up so that it has a little window that follows your mouse cursor around. So okay. you essentially just have to hover over the content that you want to look at and uh, it will blow it up. I prefer to set up because uh, I find that really annoying. And of course, if you're clicking so, on a lot of things. So, so, so the, that one setting is that the window follows the mouse as you're. The, the, uh, yeah. The so magnifying the, the window. Magnifying window the uh, no, see, the magnifying window uh, uh, essentially replaces the mouse pointer. Oh, uh, on so your instead screen. of a pointer, you're moving your mouse. You got a window. Windows. Okay, I could see that being yeah. a bit tricky. And like there's a little, so I mean, so you can still click on things because there's a mouse pointer there, but like the mouse pointer itself is replaced like with a Within giant... the window. Yeah, it's okay. it, it's so, it, to me, that can be fairly annoying. Just and, and just to step back, so in order to access this function on Windows, you yeah. go to your control panel. Go to control panel, click on settings, and settings. go to ease of access. Ease of access, yeah. okay. So All the Microsoft's built-in access. accessibility features can be found in that, in particular... that particular, particular section. Yeah, okay, great. in that section, right. Okay. Um, so, so like I said, you, so you were saying you, were, you use the way you use this magnifier, right? So the way that I like to use it, um, f for me, it, it's the most, the least cumbersome and most out of the way, is by essentially turning it into a banner 
at the top of the screen okay that, that runs the width of the monitor right it's fixed always that's fixed in a fixed okay. position right okay. so that way I, when i move my mouse around but again so what it does is it decreases your screen size significantly so depending on how so i'm losing like a, a 10 to 50 10 to 20 percent of my screen right off the bat so because i need to have this magnifier there okay but it does allow me the reason I like it to be that way is because it makes for reading content on the screen so much easier because you can just set it so that the entire like width of the text fits the banner and then you just scroll all the way down. It makes okay. makes reading very, very, very easy and simple. So reading straight text, is, if, as long as you're scrolling the magnifier, correct, works pretty efficiently. Correct. And okay. so that's what I find I use the magnifier most for is for online reading, right? Okay. Should I have to do that on a desktop, right? I mean, it came in very, very handy when I was in uh, still doing my studies in school. Okay. Um, for doing, uh, right now we're, we're we're in more of a we're in a digital world right now. Things are going very paperless. So uh, I've been able to benefit from the fact that a lot of my uh, text material in school has been digital. Right. So I can I can do a lot of my school readings on not anymore because <laughs> I've graduated. But I could I could I did a lot of my school reading right on the screen. Right. Right. Um, so the magnifier comes amazingly in handy. Okay, um, there are a couple of other things that you can access. From the same ease of access panel in Microsoft Anything Windows. Anything else that you use specifically? Well, there. So another category of applications that have come in handy in my history have been voice recognition software. Okay. Um, Interesting. And, and to be honest, in the last several years, voice recognition software has come a long way. It has. So uh, tremendously. I remember right? they they tried to introduce it to me you know, way back when, and, and it was really difficult because it required a lot of training. And well, and see, so this, the point I was going to touch on, which, you, which you're hitting on now, is the fact that what the, the real strides that have been made in the past, since 2007, really, has been the amount of training required to use um, a voice recognition software. So Microsoft has one built right in, just called Windows Speech Recognition, again, that you can access from the from ease of access settings um it doesn't work for every application but it works for a vast majority of them and this is a windows built this is a windows built-in okay. accessibility feature okay. um and like like most um out of the box voice recognition features you see a lot of them on on mobile devices now um, right siri google now mm -hmm. um cortana right these are all vo these are all out of the box voice recognition apps mm -hmm. and software that doesn't require any training at all. So the real progress that has been made in this set, in this particular industry has been like th the ability to recognize any sort of voice without hours. Because when I, so the first piece of voice recognition software that I have any experience with was using Dragon Naturally Speaking. Yeah, which is which very is popular. Developed by probably, Nuance. Probably the most popular. Probably still. And, I, and my understanding is that they outsource or they license a lot of their technology to some of the bigger firms. Yes, like So like Microsoft and Apple have, have used Nuance mm -hmm. uh, to develop their own, uh, you know, virtual sure. assistants. Probably right. And whatnot. Right. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> Dragon, naturally speaking, back then, required hours of reading into the software before it became got any good right. at being detecting with 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 reliable accuracy mm -hmm. what you were saying right mm -hmm. um however once you did invest that hours into the training it was a very handy tool the way that i used to use it was uh, actually less of an accessibility thing and even though it had those uh uses but more as a time saving measure right sure. so um a very common practice for students like i i adopted it in my undergrad and a very common practice for students would be to read through their their text notes and simply highlight and then write out notes on, on a side piece of paper or a notebook mm -hmm. like the important things right the whole system that i had set up at home which was absolutely ingenious saved me hours upon hours of time was um i would read out important passages in my note in my texts okay. and and it would dictate into a document a word okay. document and then i would have those as my notes for classes and for studying for okay. exams and whatever the case may be so you found it easier to transfer hard copy notes digitally through the using that kind of software text uh speech to text saved me a ton of time right okay. now um 
it's a far easier thing to use. I, I have essentially phased out voice recognition software from my desktop use because okay. I don't really have a need for heavy dictation. Right. right. See okay. the problem. See the, the the thing with voice recognition software, at least in my experience, is that it really only serves one purpose. You can't really use it. Like right now, I write a lot of uh, long form articles and blog articles. Right. It's voice recognition typing or dictation is not really conducive because the way that I write something creatively, right, is I'll write a sentence and then edit it several times, sure. or delete it and then rewrite it. Right. So voice. Like voice dictation is only good if you've got something right in front of you and you're just reading up. That's the only real way you're going to save time. Otherwise, it ends up becoming a much slower process. Right, because right, you're you're not getting the accuracy that, right. that you need. Where and voice recognition comes in majorly handy for me nowadays has to do with mobile devices, think, which we'll touch on later. And I think the major difference is that um, you know voice recognition on desktop um, you can't really give it commands like you can on on a mobile, right? So you're very limited with kind of what you can do and, yeah. and whatnot. It does like serve the, its the purpose. And I can understand, text. And like there are um, softwares I have very little experience with that you can teach it command, kind of like hotkeys. Okay. So you can teach it commands so it can launch certain things. I've never had n needed it to that extent. Okay. Um, it's always just been because um, when you're when you have vision impairment like I do, reading something in text, then going to looking at your screen and trying to type it in, uh, it, it takes for having your eyes adjust okay. takes just that much longer. Okay. So in order to speed up the process and remove that step, that's where I came up with the whole voice dictation idea. Okay. Right. But again, it only really makes sense if you're reading off of something because okay. it. it, it Otherwise, it becomes a much slower, like having to stop and then go okay. back and edit. It, okay. Doing that with voice commands is tough. So it was, it was an accessibility feature that you found valuable as a student, but don't really have the need for it at this point. It, it, it's it's more about, it's not about ha it having more use as a student. It's it, I find that it only really has certain uh, benefits for very specific types of tasks. Right. And I meant, I meant you personally. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah sure, absolutely. You used it. While yeah, you're a student, yeah, and now, very, very yeah. less in my professional life. Okay, it's still it, voice recognition software still makes an appearance on my mobile devices in a personal capacity. Okay, but very less as a business tool. Okay, um, yeah, for the most part. So you did mention um, the magnifier, which kind of um, addressed one aspect of your uh, impairment. Uh, what about color contrasting? Are there any tools you use on the Windows platform that help yeah. you with color contrasting, just on the desktop itself, or you know, maybe well, you can shed some light? So basically, um, every Mac, every Windows PC comes with a function whereby um, the operating system will invert all of your all of the colors, right? So as opposed, so. Um, anything that's white becomes black. Anything that's that's a color, uh, it switches to something that's a little. Uh, it's 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 opposite color, mm -hmm. right? Um, and the reason for that is because people with vision impairment often have uh, a lot more. It, it's a lot easier to read things to read white text on a black screen as opposed yeah, to black text on a white screen. It's funny because I only uh, realized that. Recently, uh, I, last year, I had done the majority of my WordCamp talks uh, on a white background with black text. And um, on two different occasions, somebody had come up to me and said, uh, it, it would actually be a lot easier to read if you had black background with white text. So this year, I actually spent a whole bunch of time redoing all of my WordCamp talks so that they were black background with white text. And uh, uh, people have found it a lot easier. Do you find personally that? Black background, white text is the easiest contrast for you to, to take in or, or, or to read? It has to do, um, it definitely is um, easier, right? And again, like, like I mentioned before, um, I can only stare at a screen for so long right? Okay. before things start to look blur. And when I'm looking at black text on a white uh, document, let's say, or a white field, um, that will start to become blurry a lot sooner, right? Oh. It's, 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 it's difficult to explain, but 
the 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 white on black is far easier on the eyes. Okay. So that uh, enables me to do a lot more reading for okay. a significant so period of time. White background, black text, do you find yeah, easier it's, to it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Like if you're gonna do like like let's say your task is to just sit at your desk and pound out a new article or a new piece of writing and you need a, like three or four hours to do it then then yeah at those instances i'll invert my screen because that's all i'm doing okay it it's horrible when you're surfing the internet <clears throat> right the I internet is that. just okay. not built for that at all right. so you end up losing some things you end up losing elements sure. photos look horrible like it's just a, an absolutely terrible right. experience so like if if you're going to do something very specific, like sit and type something in a document, then yeah, I, I've been known to alternate the uh, the contrast. But for the most part, um, I, I, I can stick to um, just the standard settings. Something that does help, um, which I'm certain uh, others probably do as well, um, is adjusting like the actual screen brightness. So this is just like a hardware setting. Okay. Right. Like, like a, um, a monitor setting. Dimming, dimming the, the the brightness of your screen again will help will help with the, the longevity, like how long you can okay. stare so at you it. You find a dimmer screen easier. Yeah, the well. the less yeah. glare, the longer I can stare at it. I think Ooh. that's just a general thing that most people will agree with. Okay. Um, so yeah, so in term, but and it, it also helps with with the contrast a little a little bit because it makes that white that much less intense. Right. So okay. so the black stands out, like the black text stands out. A little bit more so mm -hmm. just fooling around with the brightness and fooling around uh you know with that stuff it, it for the most part is enough you know and then i don't really have to dabble or fool around with the contrast settings too okay. too much right for the most part um the, the color blindness is not a major issue it doesn't interfere too much with my workflow okay um but like the vision acuity problem is a major one that okay. I need to compensate use, using these other tools and features. Okay. So for the most part, it's safe to say that in your experience, Windows has you know, Windows sufficient adequately, enough of tools for you to combat whatever um, yeah. obstacles you Look, face. Windows adequately addresses the, the needs of all of their consumers fairly well. Okay. Um, it hasn't always been that way. Mm -hmm. um, only in the Windows 10 update um, has the magnifier been like less buggy, in okay. my opinion. So it's been improved. It has been, it, but again, it still ha comes with its issues, right? Because sure. um, that, like I said, so I I use the the magnifier to create a large banner at the top of my screen. That banner sits atop every other window you launch. Right. So it either so the like um, the windows, like if you launch browser tabs, it'll either uh, sit underneath it or or fit below it. Right. Right. So like, let's say let's say you're watching a video like okay. on YouTube or on Netflix and you have your magnifier on and you blow up that video full screen. That magnifier doesn't go away. It right. sits on top of the video, which is why I said like I have to have that program pinned to the bottom of my screen so I can constantly okay. turn it on and off. So there's no easy on like, toggle. There is no at, easy at toggle this point where you could just. Maybe, I, I mean, maybe I can go out, if I set up a hotkey for it. That might be the way. It's not set by default, okay. so you just gotta like t turn it on and off, like right. execute so, it. So it's a bit bothersome at, at some points. It can. It can. It's. It's. It's just. It's not the ideal scenario, but it's the best case scenario because okay. every other magnifier setting frankly is even that much more intrusive like and bothersome right. so like i i found yeah. what the friendliest like the the you know the, they're all like the, the least problematic right. of all the settings okay right that's that's what i ended up settling on so it's that not a sense. perfect system but it still works it still works pretty good yeah. okay um yeah i mean that that's all great stuff i think that's a good um you know, that's some good info uh, on the desktop end. And I think, um, you know, that was some great uh, feedback on the tools that you can use. Uh, now, let's talk mobile because we all know that everything's moving mobile. Everybody loves mobile. Um, right. I think, again, um, we're, we're not really uh, talking Apple or iOS here. Um, I believe um, that we're all on Android here. So we're Windows and Android guys. 
And so we're, when we're talking about mobile, we're going to be talking about, or at least for from our from this experience for this discussion, um, we're going to be talking about Android. And so obviously, first and foremost, um, you know the the mobile phones, uh, you know, have already, you know, we've already seen a lot of progress in terms of the things that have been built in to mobile phones to make it more accessible. Obviously, because the device is smaller, it creates um, newer challenges. Even though the technology, you can still kind of do the same things. The fact that it's a smaller device, I think, uh, uh, raises a whole bunch of new challenges. And so um, let's touch base on, on the mobile aspect. Tell us a little bit about um, what you find difficult um, about operating with a mobile device and uh, what are some tools you use to kind of combat that? So um, the first uh, major issue with regards to using mobile technology for somebody with a vision impairment like mine um, is really like at the end of the day, I'm very limited in terms of the devices I can use okay. on a daily basis. There are certain devices that are just too difficult to use because they are just too small. Like, like I mentioned before, um, bigger is better in terms okay. of screen size. So I've been a huge, uh, I've benefited very largely from the explosion in popularity of uh, phablets. Right, phone, tablet, hybrids. Right, like I, I was. I still a, can't get used to that word. I was. I, it, it's it's a horribly <laughs> ugly word, but a really really good product in my opinion. People have their mixed reviews about them, but I mean, Samsung sells uh, ten million Note units per iteration. So they must be doing something right. People buy them, and I do. And and I and I was I used. Uh, I had a Note three for uh, two years. And uh, absolutely loved it. It, it was. No it takes three. a little bit of getting Samsung used to. No it's it's uh it's got a screen size of five point seven inches. Okay. Which is uh almost a full inch larger than what like the standard iPhone right yeah. size. So they were a bit bigger than like the the, the standard phone right. sizes. Right. Now the reason that screen size comes into play for for mold, mobile devices is very simple. Um, the, the absolute uh, greatest feature that all mobile mobile devices possess for, for people with visual impairments is pinch to zoom. Pinch to zoom okay. is uh, absolutely fundamentally necessary for me to use my device on a daily day day to day basis. Now, right. thankfully, most applications come with uh, pinch to zoom features built into it, like like Google Maps, for example. Um, some text editors, uh, most browsers, right? Which right. Are, with yeah, most yeah. mobile browsers, which are great. Um, so when using applications like that, I run into very few issues because anything that's small, I can blow up just with a simple finger. So gesture. magnifying is inherently so magnifying, a lot easier on mobile devices. It's a much easier, much more and... comfortable experience, okay. right? Now, like what you you can purchase laptops nowadays. Most laptops now have trackpads that have the finger gestures built into oh, it really? as well. I yeah, like that. if you were to buy, purchase a, a new <laughs> MacBook Air. I think I bought a laptop in like five years. But so. if you were to purchase one now, a lot of them oh. have integrated those those finger I think that's gestures. That's smart. Right into the track, so you can use your your laptop like you would use a phone, essentially. It's interesting because now people are mimicking right. mobile actions. They're trying to get that on desktop computers, right? So it's even, you know, even the desktop world is being influenced by the mobile world oh, in more yeah. ways than, than than we know. The, absolutely, for sure, and it's it's great because um, I require pinch to zooming in order to be able to read. Okay. text off of a browser um and so now the beauty of it is like the text to zoom is so important as an ex accessibility function that um both apple and google in ios and android have integrated uh what i'm going to call a universal pinch to zoom so even if an app doesn't support it you can act you can you can access pinch to zoom with a very special gesture Oh. That's so. If you go into your Android settings and go to your accessibility settings, you can access the uh, the special zoom, universal zoom feature. Okay. Now on Android devices, 
the way to access, you, obviously you have to go to your settings first and turn on the feature, but once you have, the way it's uh, executed, the way it's turned on on most Android devices is with a single finger triple tap on a screen. Okay. I can actually try to demonstrate it on my Yeah, phone. actually, that would be awesome. Let's, right since now. we've got the phone here. So, like, so he's got his Android phone so in like, here. You see? Triple tap, zooms him in. Oh, so it does it, So you could literally pinch and zoom anywhere on your phone. Like you'll see right now, I'm on my lock screen right now. Oh, right? wow. This is my phone's lock screen. And nice I can just, yeah, actually, that's the TO sky, uh, Skyline. I took that photo myself. Actually, at pretty night, that's yeah, good. using this particular phone. So right even now, your lock screen, you can uh, double, triple tap, and it will. So zoom for te in. the tech enthusiasts out there, I was using a Samsung Note 3, recently upgraded to an LG G4. This is a five-inch screen, so it's a little bit smaller than what would be, than what I was used to, but it's still pretty good in terms of screen size. Now. I know I'm bouncing back and forth between different things, but again, like the reason that screen size is so important is because I have to zoom into things. Again, I eat up valuable real estate on my phone so every time like I zoom. Third of the, I'm uh, losing a good maybe chunk. Two -thirds of your... I'm losing a good chunk of mm. what I'm able to see. So the bigger the screen, the more I'm able to see, even when I'm zoomed in. And so this particular triple tap function, just mm -hmm. to reiterate, that yep. that is. A native Android setting that built you can in turn Android on. accessibility feature. And that's right? under the accessibility Correct. settings for Android? Okay, great. Correct. That's yeah. awesome. You I can access know that existed. It, it's a universal it, any Android build, any Android phone. If you go to the accessibility features, you will be able to find it, it's got different names, but it's essentially a universal zoom that you can do. So like so now I'm just like on uh, on my home screen and again. I can zoom in. That's awesome. So it's a universal zoom. But again, so a bigger screen size is better because it allows me to see a, a lot more information and text even when I'm zoomed in, right? Mm, okay. So this is an uh, extremely handy feature that I use okay. essentially all the time. Like, no, I did also notice that um, like in your native settings, like for text messages and stuff, mm -hmm. you use a lot bigger font Correct. than I would say most people probably use. Yep. Um, is that also a native setting that you can Well, in my experience using Android and iOS for the most part, okay. the default font sizes have always been um, extremely small. Like too small for you. Again, now most, um, no, all Android devices will have an accessibility setting that will allow you to adjust text size. The problem is that it doesn't apply to all applications. It only oh. applies to um, the the pre-installed applications, as well as like a lot of the big popular applications, like the social networks, Facebook, Twitter, all those things. But it's still not universal. Okay. There is only there are only a handful of features that are truly universal that you can use throughout your phone. Like you can adjust the color and contrast features on your phone as well, just like you would do on a PC. Okay. But again, I never use it because I feel like it ruins the experience for the most part. Okay. I do heavily rely on the universal zoom to okay. do a lot of things in apps that don't have uh, built-in pinch to zoom features mm -hmm. already, okay. right, embedded. Um, so the, the font resizer you were saying is so limited. The font resizer is limited um, to just certain applications that take on um, wh whatever that that adopt that functionality as well. Okay. It's not a universal thing. Are there, are there any like notable ones you could say right off the bat that you wish had them and you're like, damn you, whatever app? Uh, not to throw anyone under the bus. But. Nothing, nothing terribly uh, noteworthy that comes to mind. But well, are, are the major ones at least? Yeah, board, the, like major, your, your no, the major no, the major players, players are, are those good. The major players are all on board, but okay. it's not a one hundred percent universal feature. I just okay. want to put that out there. But it is it is fairly widespread again because okay. like the, the the good companies that invest in their apps and and do frequent updates, they're going to have this this functionality built right in. I mean, they want to be able they want to be more accessible to their user base, sure, right? right? It's it's all about usability. That, that's what we're right. talking about here now. Um, Another issue that I run into on my mobile phones has to do with typing. Now, most keyboards are fairly small. Yes. Right? 
I find typing to be difficult. To no, say. I mean typing on a on a touch screen is already a pain to begin with, it right? Is. Now, um, having to squint to see the letters and then put the phone close to my face just makes for an even more difficult experience. Now, LG is kind of unique in this space because mm -hmm. LG has got the only um, Android keyboard that you can adjust. So you can you can uh, adjust the size of it and, and it, can you show us? Maybe perhaps. I don't know if I'm using that particular. I think I'm using Swift Key, which actually I think also uses. The oh, you same. can set up different keyboards. Yeah, yeah. So cool. Android has had the 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 functionality to swap in different keyboard since the beginning. Oh. iOS only reintroduced that feature on iOS nine. It's brand new. The ability to bring in third party keyboards. Oh. So you can and download and install all sorts of different keyboards, emo specific emoji keyboards. I don't know if I have the right keyboard installed, but one one of the built in. I don't, unfortunately. Okay. Uh, I, I found one that's comfortable to you, so I don't have to. But there is a built-in LG keyboard that you can adjust the size and make the buttons bigger. So that's oh, helpful. Okay. But um, one thing that I see, this is where voice dictation comes in majorly handy. Because when it comes to giving your phone a simple instruction or doing a quick search or typing out a quick note or sending a quick text, you can use voice dictation for all of those f features. Right. And the dictation software right out of the box is phenomenal. Like Indeed. Google now picks up everything that I say mm -hmm. and it, it almost never makes a mistake. Right. Hardly ever, right? So I've found ways to bypass having to do a lot of the typing on my phone by replacing it with voice recognition alternatives. Okay, so, right? so you're basically using uh, the the voice um, recognition software to combat the small keyboard issue. It's kind well, of relative and also, to the same. Yeah, and also okay. small type. Like, in, you know, like in some, like like sending a tweet or sending, uh, a, a, do, updating my Facebook status, for example. Mm -hmm. Sometimes reading that text in the Facebook app is extremely small because like the, the, input, the input window it is and so the text is also very small because the input window is small, right? right? Okay. So in cases like that, I've got to use my triple tap zoom magnify in feature it. to magnify it in, and then I type it in. That could be cumbersome. So you sometimes have to go back and forth in some instances where you got to see really close and then zoom out so you can finish and so then I can zoom type back and in then and zoom and back in. And okay. God forbid I have to make a correction because then right. I got to zoom in <laughs> and then the cursors. Uh, you know, like oh, yeah, trying to set a cursor on and a put phone it at a specific is spot. Literally impossible. And if you have good luck, if you have vision because I can't see that cursor to right. begin with. Okay. Ninety percent of the time, so I'm just stabbing at the dark when I'm trying to make a correction. <laughs> I've right. Done that a so of times. no, I mean, and it, I don't know if maybe other people run into this problem. You can comment on the video and let us know. But like, Please I do. have to. Um, if I make a mistake, I'm writing a sentence. I got to delete that whole sentence and type it out again from scratch and this time go slower because right. that's just faster than going back and trying to make the corrections. Yeah, sometimes. yeah. Oh yeah, I've done that but plenty anyway, of times just redo it cuz So I where's found, the cursor, who knows. I found ways around having to do a lot a lot of typing on my phone by taking advantage of a lot of built-in voice recognition features, okay. right? Like like um, uh, Google Docs, for example, is um, you know, a word processor that has voice dictation built right in, so you can just talk into it. Um, any uh, Google search that I want to do, I can just click on the Google right. Now. I mean, any Android device is going to have the Google uh, search bar right at the top with the microphone button right next to it. Yeah, so you can just right off the top. so you can just talk into it, WordPress accessibility, and it will do it will conduct your search you know right there on your phone maybe it'll it find is, us yeah Woo! and it's actually it ke as i keep talking it keeps t writing it out and it's it nails it pretty much on the dot it seems to be doing pretty well actually yeah no it's surprisingly accurate which is again like you take rem i remember voice recognition software from oh, several yeah. years ago and it was it it got good but you had to invest mm -hmm. many many hours for it to get good now it's just good right out of the box, which is, makes it super handy. Okay. Um, you know, I, I think it's kind of interesting because when we're talking about being able to read text on a mobile device, um, there's a clear difference between text you've received and text that you're inputting to send. Mm -hmm. Whereas text that you've already received, you can either 
blow up the font size or you can easily zoom in and out but yeah. when we're talking about inputting and sending text correct that's a totally different we're talking about almost a totally new issue right even though it's similar it's it, it's a totally different uh, hurdle you're actually touching on something very important here uh, and something that I, I meant to mention a little bit later on mm -hmm. now um, so having the impairment that I have right I have to compensate for my shortcomings by using the features and applications in my devices to make up for it. Now, um, the ultimate goal, so having the, the, the problem that I have means that I'm going to perform tasks and complete tasks slightly slower than the average person. But I can make up for that time differential um, by, um, what's the word? By clearly streamlining my workflow, my streamlining my daily workflow to maximize efficiency, right? Now, the way that I do that is I compartmentalize my tasks. So certain tasks get completed on a mobile device because it's just a much more comfortable ex and easier experience, right? Whereas easier to get done. Certain tasks are far easier to do on a desktop, right? Now, what you're saying is the, the point that you make actually clearly differentiates how I split my day. Oh, really? R reading, reading gets done so on mobile devices, writing is what we're talking about. Ta typing gets typically done on a desktop, okay. right? Because to avoid those text input problems, right? Sure. Because text input fields, really, there's no give there for the most part in terms of zooming. Mm -hmm. It becomes Absolutely. an extremely difficult process. <laughs> and if you're trying to type in something into a specific field and you have to zoom into part of it, you lose the other part of that yeah. field. You can't you see add it all context of your... all of a sudden with your sentence. And so sense. it's it, you have to zoom in and then zoom out and then zoom back in again to see the other part of the field. It just becomes horrible. Right. And um, it, I mean, interesting enough, like even personally, um, you know, I try to avoid typing on a mobile device as much as possible because I too feel that it it takes longer. It's more difficult. It's right. a lot less easy to correct things Touch and, screens again are different. You know, so usually you usually tell the people like phone. send me an email and i'll definitely get back to you because i could just type away send it back right and i don't have to worry whereas right. uh, text messages long text messages i find are just completely uh you know take way too long and are, are just way too troublesome so right so, Interesting. so on you a typical split your workflow based on reading and writing almost i guess to simplify it sure Base and, and oh, choose absolutely. your device based on what you have to do so in, in either aspect so in, in in content marketing a lot of what i do is um is uh write articles and blogs and publish original content for websites uh to boost their seo now um the way i split up my work to really maximize the time of my day is i'll do all my reading and research on either an, a tablet or my phone, mm -hmm. right? And then I will take that research and do the actual uh, writing and drafting of the work on my desktop computer. Now, it's cool because there are applications, I mean, the advent, the fact that the cloud has become this great, amazing thing allows for cross-platform and cross-device okay. syncing. Which is, it's great that you mentioned this because I did want to be able to tie the two in. And I think what you're getting into yeah. nicely ties the two where you can use both Correct. platforms in your workflow right. and then still you know, do research on one end, publish yeah. the work on the is, other. If something, and, is more difficult, if something is more difficult for me to do on a desktop, I switch that activity to a mobile device right. and vice versa, mm -hmm. right? Like, unless you have like a Bluetooth keyboard that's really good and responsive, typing on a on a tablet is not... It's not any better than a phone. I, I, unless, I mean, unless it's 140 characters, anything right. more than that, <laughs> right? And it just takes too long, right? So the way my typical workday kind of unfo unfolds like this. I get up in the morning and I want to get a taste for the news. So what's happening sure. out there in the tech world, a, a right? I get on my there. I get on my tablet and I'll use um, a blog or news aggregating apps like uh, like Flipboard, for example, which is my favorite. Right? It, it draws best. in it draws in articles from all of my favorite blogs, puts them into one place, and I can just flip through them and take a look and see everything at a glance. Right? Um, the real time saving app that also has great accessibility features is what I call, I mean, it, it falls under the category of read later applications. The one I like to use is called Pocket, right? Right, you were now, telling me this the other day and I was actually pretty right. 
pretty intrigued by now, it. Now, the reason why Pocket is so great for people with visual impairments is it because it'll take that really busy, cluttered, link-filled, image-filled blog post and strip away all that nonsense, leave you with just a, a bit of text and a couple of images, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's the perfect uh, reading experience on a tablet. Throws away all the clutter. And it also has um, that the app has also built in accessibility features of its own. So you can adjust the text size to make it bigger. Okay. You can invert for what they call the comfortable or um, night reading. So the black, oh, the okay. white on black, right? right? And the various dimming. All that right stuff now. built right so into the application. Let, let's let's just step back a bit. So basically, what we're talking about is using this app called Pocket to save various articles from various sources. Right. So and Pocket can, is right. Sorry yeah. to interrupt, but Pocket yeah. is great because they've really um, expanded themselves very well. They have mobile phone apps, tablet apps, and also browser extensions. Right. Yeah. So you can, if you're using Google Chrome at home. You can install the pocket extension, right? And so anything, like let's say you're just browsing the internet and you come across a cool blog, you just tap on the pocket extension, it saves to your pocket. Anything that you find on Flipboard or browsing the mobile web on your phone, again, save right to pocket, right? So it, it conglomerates, so, mm -hmm. it, all of the stuff that I find that I wanna isolate, all the really good articles, I can throw them onto pocket mm -hmm. and then that becomes the place where I essentially do all the reading. Like, mm -hmm. like Flipboard allows me to just look through through headings and yeah, find you're interesting just, stuff. You're just trying to find something that right. grabs your attention. You save it to Pocket. But then I save it to Pocket, and then, and then really there I can really it. dive in and read it because it makes for the most comfortable reading experience. Right. So right. I guess even alternatively, like on the desktop, if you were just, you know, headline surfing, you could save a bunch of stuff to Pocket, and then, then when you, you have to go back to reading it, you fire up your tablet right and now you've got your perfect reading experience uh, absolutely outlined for right you. i mean All your accessibility settings saved and, and the reading run. experience in pocket is actually fairly good in the browser as well but oh, really? like the fact that like i use i prefer to use it on my tablet because that's also where i have um my flipboard mm -hmm. it's also where i have my social media dashboards mm -hmm. like when i'm when i'm when i'm turning articles into 140 character posts i can do all of that work directly from my iPad. So I can spend my 9 a.m. to 12 doing all research, social media posting, all from my tablet, which mm -hmm. is super convenient and makes for a very comfortable reading experience where I can zoom and I can adjust the texting and, and really get a lot done. But when it comes time to like take some of those articles and turn them into a full out blog post, I will, uh, because everything is synced to Pocket, I can just open up my browser on my computer, access my Pocket, all of my articles are saved there, and then I can cut and paste and, and extract the pieces that are interesting and then start molding them into a, a, a blog post. But the actual typing and editing and all that stuff is done from a desktop because it's just faster using a physical keyboard and having to do all that stuff on a, on a, on a on a screen, yeah, so absolutely. that's typically how I maximize my efficiency and productivity in a typical workday. I compartmentalize the activities so that no no one thing is too difficult to do. Right. So you're not. I mean, it, it, from what it sounds like, and I guess to summarize, I know that um, you know usually our runtime here is half an hour. We're actually at about the hour mark, but I don't care. We're gonna do what we want. Jason's here. I'm here. Uh, but anyways, we'll, we'll, I kind of just want to summarize it up, and and, and from, you know, from from what it sounds like you're saying, um, you know, in order to combat, uh, you know, the, the the impairment that you have, you know, accessibility for you is not strictly tool. You've put together a system, a process in which whatever you whatever time you lose because of your impairment, you can gain by intelligently. Yeah. scheduling and making processing out all of your tasks so that right. you can get things done the real the real way. secret is to identify the like to, to be a productive professional with a visual impairment and to utilize technology to its max mm -hmm. the real key is to isolate um, which activities you know task managing and time managing is important isolating mm -hmm. which activities you need to perform in that day and then finding 
the most useful, comfortable device to perform that task. Like, so for me, breaking it down by reading and writing has just made things super simple. I mean, other people will find different breakdowns and probably sure. find using a tablet, uh, like the, the, the functions that I use it for, other people will find it to be cumbersome or difficult Absolutely. or whatever. So it's not a cookie cutter that everybody can use. Like I found tasks that are comfortable for me to do with my vision on tablets, tasks that are comfortable for me to do on PCs, and then I just split the work and split the tasks accordingly in order to get it all done. And what brings it all together has been the cloud for the most part. And the cloud, I mean, if there's gonna be one overarching tool that has really facilitated uh, you know, my productivity and my workflow, it's the cloud because it, it allows me to do stuff on a mobile are device. Are we talking about a specific cloud or just the cloud in general? Well, just the cloud in general. Okay. Um, you know, because I mean, different sort like like Dropbox utilizes its own cloud. Yeah, Microsoft's okay. got its own cloud. No, I'm, I'm just, just curious. I'm just a big fan of the cloud. It. Well, because Anything I that's on the cloud is good. I mean, because I utilize all of those right. in any given part of my day, right? That's like nice. I've got all sorts of cloud storages, I've, you know, and Google's got its own cloud. So in general, being able to start a task on a device and then finish it on a PC yeah. has been. Uh, just yes. life changing, and and it, it really helps. It out. really facilitates that streamlining of what device, what tool to use, right. even more because yeah. now you can cross transfer whatever you've done here to there, there yeah. to here, and kind of make it all work together. I would definitely be slowed down had if I had to perform every single one of my tasks on a computer or every single one of my tasks on on a mobile device. Right, right. Um, the ability. Using both is what allows me to overcome the the time I would lose, you know, because of my visual impairment sticking to any one device. It kind of sounds like you've got, you know, this giant, you know, I imagine like going to a car garage and they open up these giant toolboxes and you've got yours already laid out, you know, which one you need to use at what time and how to get things done. And, and uh, that's really great stuff. Um, you know, I'm pretty sure that we could talk a lot more about this stuff, but I think we'll leave it at that. Um, that was definitely some awesome stuff. I really do appreciate your your input. Uh, you've been a fabulous guest, and we would love to have you on again and share some more info. Um, Great to be here. To everyone out in the internet world, uh, we're going to say thank you to Jason. Be sure to tune in in the new year. We've got uh, a great new episode lined up. We're going to be talking about WordPress accessibility theme reviews. We've got two big names on board. I'm not going to tell you yet. I'm going to make you wait. I'm going to make you wonder. Um, but we'll definitely be back. And if I don't see you then, I wish everyone uh, a great night and keep things accessible. Take it easy. Follow me, Jason Quintel. Bye-bye.